Numerical integration techniques are sometimes required for calculating maximum likelihood estimates of statistical models. This is a bit of a technical topic, but there are a couple of practical reason, reasons why understanding what numerical integration is, is useful for an applied researcher. Also, if you're a really advanced applied researcher, you might sometimes find that your statistical software does not have a, an estimation routine for the kind of model that you're interested in, and you might want to program your own estimator. In that case, understanding numerical integration becomes useful. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of why an applied researcher should care. The first time I encountered numerical integration was in the context of nonlinear structural ecosystem models. So here we are estimating a fairly simple model. We have uh, four latent variables, or we have a couple of indicators each, and we estimate an order of probit model. And it takes forever to estimate. So this, this runs for maybe hours on my work computer. And so that's one way you might encounter numerical integration. Another less common way that you might encounter numerical integration is that you get weird results. So you are running a stati statistical model and then you reorder your data or you restart your computer, reload the data set and you forget to order the data. And from the same data, you get two different sets of results depending on how the data are ordered. This is because of imprecision of certain numerical uh, integration techniques. Let's take a look at why we use numerical integration and then what numerical integration does and then how we can make numerical integration work a, a bit faster in some scenarios. So normally when we estimate latent variable models, let's use the, core, uh, the uh, factor analysis model here as an example, but this applies to all latent variable models, including random uh, effects in multi-level models. So normally how we estimate this factor analysis model we do something called a model implied covariance matrix and because this is a just identified model we would estimate this by setting these model implied covariances to be equal to the opposite covariances and then just solve the equation see the equations if we have an over identified model then the estimation criterion is that we adjust the model parameters so that we have the implied covariance matrix and the actual object covariance matrix to be as close as one another and one another as possible and the closeness is measured using the maximum likelihood criteria. Okay this works really well and it's quick and it's useful technique for most applications but it faces some border, uh, boundary conditions so it doesn't always work. The first obvious thing is that if we have very many object variables then uh, using this technique becomes impractical. Let's say, we have, let's say we have a thousand indicators in our factor model, then this wouldn't really work because 1000 by 1000 covariance matrix takes a lot of memory and a lot of computation time to, uh, to do the matrix calculations. This might sound something that you never face, but it's actually fairly common. So consider multi-level modeling and consider nested data. So if you have industry effect in multi-level models, you might have something like 20 years panel, so you have 20 observations for each company. And then you might have 50 companies in each industry. So you have 1000 observations in each industry. And to estimate an industry effect, you would, which you don't observe, you would have to fit a latent variable model and you might calculate this kind of huge correlation matrix and get the covariance between all the observations. That would be your industry effect. But th that is not feasible because of the size of the matrix. So we need to have different techniques. Another boundary condition is, uh, is non-linear models. So let's assume that you have, instead of linear model, you have a probit model for these indicators. And we can no longer use covariances because covariances quantify linear relationships and this is a non-linear model. So for non-linear models, we need to use alternate techniques. We can no longer rely on covariances because they are fundamentally linear. The third case is interactions. We have a latent variable A here and in here is an observed variable, but we can't interact. We can't multiply those variables together because we don't have values for the A. It's latent. And we can't use covariances either because now we have three variables. We have M, A1 and a latent A relationship. 
three variable relationship and a covariance is always between two variables. So covariance is a linear relationship with two variables and this could not be estimated from a covariance matrix. Let's take another example of, of how there are the numerical integration works and how it affects the results. So I'm estimating the same model using status SCM here and then we are using status GSM, Generalized Structural Equation Modeling. We estimate the same model. So we have a 10,000 observations, so that's a large sample size just to make a point. And one factor, three indicators, it's just identified. The SCM is very easy to estimate, but there are a couple of interesting things that we'll find. I'm also using timer, so we can compare how long it takes to run the SCM model versus the GSM estimation. And the SCM results are here. So we have the usual stuff, we have the estimates, we have the, uh, the chi-score test and it's, it's zero because there's a, this is just an identified model. And when we take a look at the, the GSM results, we can see that the estimates and the standard errors, they are the same and the likelihoods are the same, but there is a couple of, there are a couple of interesting uh, things that we note. When we look at the timers here, we note that the GSM is about 10 times slower than the normal SCM for this simple model. And we also note that there is no chi-score statistic for the GSM. The chi-score statistic is not very useful in this case because the model is not, it's uh, saturated, it can be tested, but nevertheless we don't get the chi-score, otherwise the results are identical. So, so what explains? If we take a look at how these models are estimated, these two different commands actually use very different ways to calculate the likelihood. So when we look at the SCM documentation, there are the, the equations part of the documentation, the technical explanation tells us that we have the parameter vector and then uh, we, we make that thing, log likelihood, as large as possible and the log likelihood involves uh, the, the observed covariance matrix. It involves something that looks like that. So that's the model implied covariance matrix. And we make them as close as one another as possible. Then when we take a look at the GSM documentation, the same section, it shows something quite different. So there's this, this integration symbol here and uh, there is no covariance matrix of the data. So what we're actually doing is that we are no longer comparing the observed covariances against the implied covariances and calculating the likelihood of getting a one sample covariance from an estimated population covariance matrix. But instead we, we are looking at observation level likelihoods. So, so we are calculating the likelihood of, of each observation or, or a cluster of observations depending on the model. And uh, then those likelihoods are multiplied together and that gives us the full likelihood. So how does it actually work? How do observation level likelihoods work? If we take a look at this data, so we have uh, four groups of four data points each and the ID variable indicates the group and our regression model, we want to regress the Y, the dependent variable on the ID and X if we just calculate normal regression analysis using maximum likelihood estimation, we would calculate the fitted value here. So it is simply the sum of id and x using the regression coefficients as weights. And then we would take a look, uh, then we would estimate uh, how likely we are going to get this, this y of 0 0.6, for example, from a normal distribution with mean of 2 and a variance of, of 0.7 and that the log likelihood for that observation would be minus 2.2. So this is uh, fairly simple if you know how to do it. So we calculate the fitted value, we estimate um, the, the variance of the, the error term, and then we check how likely we would be to get the observation that we just got from a normal distribution centered at the fitted value, having the variance of the error term. We multiply all those likelihoods or we sum the log likelihoods together and that gives us the total likelihood or the total log likelihood depending on if we're working on likelihoods or logs. Now, problems begin when we don't observe the ID. So, so we assume that there's some kind of group level effect 
but we don't know, we don't have values for that group level effect. That, that might be unobserved heterogeneity in econometrics, or it might be a latent variable a factor in factor analysis, but we don't have values for, for the ID. So what do we do? Well, we can make an assumption that the ID is normally distributed. We pretty much always assume that continuous unobserved or latent variables are normal because that simplifies the calculations and we need to make some kind of assumption of the distribution anyway to calculate the maximum likelihood estimates. We can also work with categorical latent variables, but for now let's just focus on the uh, normal case. Let's take a look, look closer look at now the observation level likelihood. So how would we calculate this log likelihood for the first observation if we don't know the value of the, of the cluster or group level effect ID or the value. So what we actually do here is that, um, this is from the state of documentation, is that we calculate the, the likelihood of, uh, for a, of an observation for a specific set of latent variable values U. And so we, we assume that the latent variable has a specific value, let's say zero, and we calculate likelihood. And then uh, we have the probability density of a set of latent variable values u. So we have the probability density of the latent variable, we have the likelihood calculated at a specific value, and we multiply them together. So, so what's the point? The point here is that, that we estimate the model, we calculate the likelihood by calculating the likelihood for every possible value of the unobserved variable u here, and take the weighted average. So if we have a, a, a latent variable which has an estimated standard deviation of 1 and estimated mean of 0, or typically the mean is fixed at 0, then we would give the value calculated at latent variable's value 0 a lot more weight than the, uh, for a value that is calculated, uh, the likelihood that is calculated at latent variable value of minus 4 because that would be very unlikely from a standard normal distribution. In practice, we don't calculate every possible value because that would just, on a normal distribution, would take forever because there are uh, infinite different values on normal distribution. What we do instead is that we apply numerical integration techniques to this integral here. Now we get to the question of what is numerical integration. You might remember from high school that the idea of uh, the, what integration does is that it, it calculates the area under the curve. And numerical integration is a, a way to numerically approximate the area under the curve. So this is normal distribution. We know that this is a, because it's probably the density, the area is, is one by definition, but we can still use it as an example. So one way to calculate estimate area under the curve is to approximate this with a histogram. So we would calculate the value, the height of this curve at four points, x equals minus four, x equals two, x equals zero, x equals two, and x equals four. And uh, we weight them so each has an equal weight. And uh, we calculate the function value, the height of the curve, and, and that function value multiplied by the weights and taking a sum gives us the area. So it is off by 1.4%, but pretty close, even with this good approximation. These x values are called integration points. So we have here five integration points. We can make the integral more precise by increasing the number of points. For example, with uh, 10 points, we would have uh, this kind of histogram, and now we get a very precise estimate already we can add even more and now we can see that we would, with 100 points, we would be pretty uh, well equipped to uh, approximate also almost any kind of curve. Normally, when we, when we start learning about numerical integration, we use equal weights. Like, like we, the, the bars here are equally spaced. So each has a weight of 0.1 and previously we had a weight of 1 and weight of 2. But the general strategy is that we don't use equal weights. Instead, we strategically choose a couple of uh, x values, 5, 7, sometimes 12, 16. And uh, 
then we calculate the function value at those x values and then we weight them differentially because we are strategic in our choice of x and we're just not taking them equally spaced. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. So if we want to estimate uh, the mean of a normal variable. So we have a standard normal variable, so a standard normal distribution uh, multiplied by x and we want to know what is the mean of x. So the idea of calculating a mean is that you, you sum all possible values of x. Of course we don't have all possible values so we just take the weighted sum of the probability density and the actual value of the x and this is the probability density, this is the probability density multiplied by x and we take the, um, the area under the curve. So here we have a negative part, so this is negative something, this is positive something and they cancel out because this is symmetric and uh, the, the area under the curve is zero, which is the mean of a normal standard normal variable. This red here is called the prior distribution and uh, understanding the prior distribution and understanding that this blue one is posterior distribution is useful when you read about uh, for example Bayesian analysis or if you read about uh, how to solve problems with numerical integration because some of these problems involve the shape of the posterior distribution. But for now prior distribution is the, uh, is the distribution over which you integrate, so we're integrating over the normal distribution and posterior distribution is the, uh, is the uh, function value times the prior distribution. If we want to estimate um, the variance of a normal distribution we would calculate what is the average square deviation from the mean, the same principle we would take uh, the deviation from the mean u, zero by definition here, could be also estimated and we calculate x minus uh, u squared and then we multiply the probability density here. So we get these two peaks and the area under these two curves, uh, under this blue curve is one and that is the variance of a standard normal variable. In practice the choice of these integration points is, is critical. So that determines how well the integral works. Fortunately there are a couple of really good ways of choosing the integration points. We almost always when we work with normal distributed variables we apply something called gauss hermite quadrature rule and I don't even try to explain how that is derived but the idea here is that uh, we have weights, we have a uh, what, what's called abscissa. In the literature I just call them x values because that's, that's more familiar to me and uh, we calculate the value of the function at, at the strategically chosen x values and then uh, weight those x values and take a sum. How do we know the x values and the weights? Well uh, we can just take a look at a table provided in a book or many books about statistical estimation provide these tables and um, alternatively we can use an online calculator or a statistical program normally has a calculator that provides us these weights and x values. When we integrate over normal distribution there is, uh, there is something that we need to understand about this, this gauss hermite quadrature approach and it's, it calculates integral of form e to the power of minus x squared. And if we take a look at the normal distribution here, so this is uh, pretty close to, uh, to the e to the power of, of minus x squared, except that uh, we have some unnecessary stuff here. So we have the, uh, the, the subtraction, uh, subtracting the mean and then dividing by the two, two times the variance. So we need to do something called change of variables. So instead of integrating over uh, directly over the y value, we integrate over, over x and then we define y as a function of x. So we define uh, <clears throat> y as a function of x, we uh, plug that in and then that gives us the integral. This same thing is actually explained in the, in the Stata user manual where you, the Stata developers tell that well you have the, uh, the, quad, the quadrature points from the gauss hermit rule and then you, the actual uh, x values or abscissas here and the weights are calculated using, using those equations. So we have the likelihood function, then we have the normal density, 
and in, in the general case we would calculate the, the abscissas like, like so and the weights like so for uh, a normally distributed, normally distributed variable centered at zero. So most of the time our variables are centered at zero. If they're not, we can easily just move uh, the, uh, just re-specify the, the problem a bit so that the latent variable is centered at zero and then we just uh, include an intercept to the model. This works remarkably, remarkably well for many problems, but there are cases where this gauss hermite quadrature approach does not work well. And the, the case is shown here. So if we have five integration points shown in the first figure, but our posterior peak or, or the mass of the posterior happens to be right between two integration points, then the integral can be seriously misleading or seriously incorrect. And what we do then is that instead of using the original gauss hermit uh, quadrature rule for integration, we use something called mean variance adaptive, adaptive, adaptive quadrature. There are other variants of adaptive quadrature beyond the mean variance, but the mean variance is the default in, in Stata, for example. And what we do is that instead of, of using the original, the prior distribution to calculate the weights and abscissas, what we do is that we take a look at the posterior distribution. So we, we estimate the mean and standard deviation of the posterior distribution, and then we choose the weights based on the mean and uh, the weights and abscissas based on the mean and, and variance of the posterior instead of the prior. Okay, so that's a bit of a theory. A bit of the theory. If you search for uh, for quadrature in like state user manual, you'll find probably uh, at least a thousand hits in all the manuals. So this is uh, uh, all over the place in Stata and it's also used in many other statistical software as well. So how is numerical integration related to estimating of latent variable models? Let's return to our example of calculating these observation level likelihoods. So how would we actually proceed in estimating the likelihoods in this case? So let's take a look. So instead of integrating or calculating the value of, of the first ID at every possible uh, place, we proceed one group at a time and let's use three integration points. So let's say that we uh, take three points. We have one point in the middle, zero, and that receives the most weight because that is the most likely one value to get from that distribution. And then we have one value from the left tail and one value from the right tail with smaller weights. And uh, if we run this with Stata, with three integration points, we get some coefficients, we get the variance of the latent variable, so we don't get any, any coefficients for the latent variable, just enters the variance comp component to the model, and we get a log likelihood of minus 23. So how does it actually work? Now, this is our mean variance adaptive Gauss, Gauss Hermit quadrature, and we're just going to be using the, the non-adaptive version because it's a lot simpler. So the likelihood is not exactly the same, but in this case it will get close. So, so how does the computation work? Well, let's take a look at first cluster then. So we would start by calculating the likelihood assuming that the latent variable is on the left tail. So uh, the value for, for the abscissa would be minus 1.59 and the value of the weight would be minus 0.70. So we calculate the fitted value using these models. So we, we enter x times uh, 0.86 plus a1 plus constant. That gives us the fitted value for the first observation. And then we uh, center a normal distribution on that fitted value. We take the variance of the error term and we then estimate how likely we would get, how likely we would be to get the value of y of 0.60 from a, a normal distribution centered at 1.72 having variance of 0.75. Uh, and that gives us the likelihood, the log likelihood. And then, uh, or actually we're working on our likelihoods here. And then the, the likelihood, the total likelihood for, for this cluster of four observations, this group of four observations at these latent variable values is the product of all these likelihoods. Why we work with likelihoods instead of a log likelihoods will become clear in, in a moment. 
Then we repeat the same for another value of the latent variable. So uh, the second value that we try is zero. It receives more weight, 0.67 compared to 0.17, because it's a more likely value from that distribution. And then we go to the, uh, the right tail and uh, abscissa 1.59. So this is symmetric. First we try minus 1.59, now we do 1.59 and weight is 0.17. We calculate the log likelihood, the likelihoods for each observation and then multiply them together to get the observation level likelihood. Now the total likelihood on, shown on this, this fifth row that I've added to the data is the weighted sum of these individual likelihoods. So we would take what is the likelihood of this cluster of four observations, the total likelihood, if the latent variable is on the left tail, uh, that is 0 0.013, we multiply that with the weight 0 0.17. If the latent variable is in the center of the distribution, then the likelihood is 0 0.02, we multiply that by 0 0.17, and then the third likelihood is multiplied that with the third weight, and the weighted sum is our likelihood, and then we can take a log, it gives us the log likelihood. We do this uh, for every group, so we integrate once over the distribution of the latent variable for each group, one group at a time, and that gives us the likelihood of each group. So we don't actually have uh, the full likelihoods of each observation, because the observations are not independent, and because they're not in, they're independent, we can't, the likelihood of one observation depends on another one, and therefore uh, we can't just say that one likelihood is, is something independently of any other variable. So we can also only consider the likelihood on the cluster or group level. And uh, if we sum these log likelihoods together here, we will get a likelihood that is pretty close to the R uh, likelihood that Steta gives. It's not exactly it's the same because this is the non-adaptive version of the quadrature rule and Steta uses the mean adaptive version, mean variance adaptive quadrature because that is performs a lot better in practice. It, it avoids our problems that we run to using the, the traditional quadratic rule, quadrature rule. So this is the single latent variable case. What if we have correlated latent variables? If we have correlated latent variables, what we need to do is to construct a, a nested integral. So the idea is that uh, we, we first need to, need to somehow make the latent variables uncorrelated. So if we uh, calculate, remember the idea of, of calculating the likelihood of, an observe of a model with a latent variable is to integrate. And we can have, if we have two variables, then we have an integral and then that goes over the first variable and the likelihood of the observations that we integrate over contains another integral. So if we have two latent variables, we have two integrals. So we call this nested integrals. And uh, th this works if the latent variables are uncorrelated. But most of the time, our latent variables are correlated in our models and we want to estimate that correlation. So we use something called Kolesky decomposition. You don't have to understand what it means, I don't. But this is a technique that we can use to, uh, to get correlated variables out of uncorrelated ones. And you'll see the term applied quite often in these models that apply numerical integration. What Kolesky decomposition does, this is again an example using Stata, is that if we have a matrix of uncorrelated latent variables, Cx, that's our uncorrelated latent variable matrix, and, and Cy is uh, the estimated latent variable correlation matrix. So we want to, uh, the, the estimated correlation matrix, it looks like that, but we have to integrate over that matrix. And what we do is that we first generate values from the, the uncorrelated latent variable covariance matrix, then the Kolesky decomposition of this uh, correlation matrix gives us something called a projection matrix and we can, we can uh, calculate uh, projections from that uncorrelated latent variable set to a correlated one. So in practice uh, we would uh, take the, uh, the, the latent variables for the first group, we would up, uh, calculate, uh, multiply that with the, uh, the projection matrix to get a correlated set of latent variables and uh, 
that gives us the correlation structure that we want. This is also a technique that we use when we want to generate a correlated, latent, correlated random numbers using computers. So a computer generates first uncorrelated numbers, then it applies Kolesky decomposition to the desired correlation matrix, and then you get the correlated numbers. So this is the, uh, the list of the x variables, they are uncorrelated, and then uh, we get uh, these are the y variables, so we have uncorrelated x variables, and when we apply the projection matrix, we get correlated y variables. So what is the relevance here uh, to numerical integration? Uh, the numerical integration works, or we can do this nested integration when the latent variables are uncorrelated. So we, we integrate over uncorrelated latent variables, and then uh, we project those uncorrelated latent variables into correlated ones, using the Kolesky decomposition and that gives us the value of the likelihood assuming that the latent variables are correlated. So this is a bit of a technical thing but uh, just to know that when you what you need to know is that when you see the word Kolesky decomposition that just relates to, uh, to getting correlated variables out of uncorrelated ones in this application context. So this is the, the adaptive quadrature way of integrating. So you choose a couple of points strategically, then uh, you, you weigh, calculate function values at those points, you calculate the weighted sum of, uh, of the function value, and if you have multiple latent variables, then you need to work uh, integrate over uncorrelated latent variables that you make correlated ones in the, that you recast into the correlated ones using the Kolesky decomposition and that gives you the, the value of the likelihood. There is another way that is sometimes used for calculating integrals and it's called Monte Carlo integration. The idea of Monte Carlo integration is that instead of drawing a few numbers of these latent variables strategically, we draw a lot of numbers. So uh, we just take random numbers from the normal distribution. So for example 100, we estimate the likelihood for each, each set of, or each value and then we take the mean. So for example, uh, if we have a, a normally distributed variable here and we want to know what is the, the mean of squared of square of normal distribution, then we would simulate observations from this normal distribution, calculate mean square of each observation. Here the da dashed line shows how the mean develops. So when we increase the number of observations, number of replications uh, to, to 40, 45, 50, we can see that this uh, mean gets closer and closer to 1, which is the correct value, and uh, with uh, about 1000 iterations we get very close to the correct value. So 500 iterations this time and we get very close to the 1. So the idea of, of uh, Monte Carlo integration is that instead of, of calculating strategically chosen points, weight them, we take a lot of points and then uh, we take most points that are most closest to the mean and less points on, on, the, on the tails and calculate the likelihood value and then take a sum. So this is a lot easier to understand than the, the quadrature approach. So which one should be applied? The, for simple problems, the, the gauss hermite quadrature is, is, uh, is superior. It produces uh, more precise integrals and it's a lot faster because you might need just, uh, let's say, 5 or 7 or 12 integration points. And uh, this Monte Carlo technique requires typically hundreds of points. But there, there are scenarios where Monte Carlo techniques are useful. In practice, the analytical technique, uh, we apply uh, adaptive quadratures nowadays because the, the Gauss Hermit, the basic version, does not work well for all problems. And the mean variance adaptive quadrature is the technique that is default in many statistical software because it's more robust. So we choose weights and abscissa based on posterior mean and variance instead of based on the normal distribution. And there are also others. So, uh, gauss conrad is another technique that is sometimes used. I don't know what it does, but the principle is the same. You have weights, you have points, and then you calculate a weighted sum. And one interesting application, uh, alternative technique, is the Laplace approximation. So the idea of Laplace approximation is that it's not really an integration technique. Instead, it's an approximate technique of the, integra of, of the integral. But what is 
really useful in Laplace approximation is that it, it uses only one integration point. And if you only use one integration point, then calculation is a lot faster. And this becomes a real issue when you have a high dimensional integral. So if you are only, if you are only one latent variable in your model, and let's say we have five integration points, that's five. If you have two latent variables, five times five, 25 integration points. If you have three latent variables, we are looking already at 125 integration points because it's nested integral. So you need to uh, estimate each integral multiple times and each integral has five points. If you have four latent variables, we have 625 integration points. So this quickly gets out of hand when you have a big model. What is an advantage in the Monte Carlo in integration is that while it can be imprecise, if the R value, the number of replications is small, there is a more, the user has more direct control over computation time. And uh, if you decide that you want to draw 1000 replications, then you are going to be throwing 1000, drawing 1000 values of latent variables, regardless of the complexity of the problem. This is because you don't do nested integration, but you can instead draw, if you have four latent variables, you, you draw samples from a four variate normal distribution. So you get all latent variables values in, in one, one draw. And uh, if computational time becomes an issue, then what you can do is either to decrease the number of integration points or you can apply Laplace approximation, which is uh, scales a lot better in complex problems than these, uh, these uh, quadrature techniques. But and one thing that you should know is that if you, if you start to simplify the integration, then you lose precision. So it's a good idea to always uh, then increase the quadrature points when you are running the final model and for example, Stata has a special command quad check for checking if your approximations are good or not. So always re-estimate the final model with more integration points. But if you're just working on developing your model, then for example, using the Laplace approximation to just see what the results are quickly is sometimes a good idea.